Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to uh, the Bristow session on uh, what a time to be AI live. Who knew that we'd come up with such a flashy title? All our own work, nearly. No generative artificial intelligence involved at all in that one. Um, my name is Chris Holder. I'm a partner in the commercial IT department here and have been a tech lawyer for over 30 years. So it's changed a bit in that 30 years from very large systems and people with spanners to what we have today, which is a bit glorious. Now, the first thing I have to do is uh, give you some housekeeping rules. And uh, just to let you know, the toilets are outside behind the stairs. Um, you know, if you've been out there, turn, turn right and they're just behind the stairs. There are no fire alarm tests due for today. So if the fire alarm goes off, please find your nearest exit, which might be up behind you. Uh, assemble at Carmelite Street. So if we all go out left across the road and then it's left and left um, or towards the Bride's Tavern as was. And if you turn left and head towards the Harrow, you'll see us all just about there. Um, so artificial intelligence. Eh? Now, what a tricky little technology this is all turning out to be. Thank you, madam. <laughs> it, is, it is going to change the world. Uh, all industrial sectors will be affected. But what is artificial intelligence? How does it work? What are its ramifications? And how do large language models, or LLMs, fit in here? I mean, there's been a huge amount of chat generated by and reported upon LLMs recently. But let's be fair. Who doesn't want to click on something at work and produce a haiku poem about their own rugby club? Now, these are the things that really matter to us. But, um, but what is an LLM? How are they going to be used in the future? What are the legal ramifications of what they produce? And is it right to ask someone or ask uh, an AI to assume the persona of a famous person and then run an interview um, with that AI and pass it off as the original figure just to increase uh, magazine sales? All of which leads us to this afternoon and our panel of experts who are going to help us understand and answer some of those questions. Um, so let me introduce our panelists, most of whom are sitting, sitting over here. Um, first is uh, Dr. Claudio Calvino. Claudio, give everyone a wave. Um, Claudio from FTI Consulting. Claudio is a senior managing director in the Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment based in London, where he's a senior member of the data and analytics team. Prior to joining FTI Consulting, Claudio served as a lead data scientist at French multinational consulting company Capgemini and WPP's Canter Media. And you did a lot of work in this building, I understand. Yes, good. He holds a BSc in political science, an MSc in international relations, and a PhD in economic geography. And is also a member of the advisory board of the PhD in and MSc programs in social data science at the University of Oxford. Now, to help us provide a business perspective and who will be joining us later, we also have Sean Williams, who is a founder and chief executive of Autogen AI. And Sean has worked in research, policy, business development, operational management for some of the largest and most successful public service providers in the UK. Prior to starting Autogen AI, Sean founded and was chief executive at Corndale Limited, which is a major provider of training and development services. He grew from scratch to 350 people prior to selling in November 2020. Sean lists his interests as many, many fold. Artificial intelligence, the future of work, business creation, evidence-based policy, sustainable social enterprise, incentives, technology, human potential, ideas, and delivery. So when he turns up, he won't be short of a few words on these subjects. I can guarantee that. Next, we have on our panel, we have Professor Lillian Edwards. She will provide us with an insight into the current thinking between, behind how our laws and regulations need to adapt to this new technology. Lillian is currently Professor of Law, Innovation and Society at Newcastle University. Lillian is a leading academic in the field of internet law and has taught information technology law 
e-commerce law, privacy law, and internet law at undergraduate and postgraduate levels since 1996, and has been involved with law and artificial intelligence since 1985. She's worked in these fields at the universities of Strathclyde, Edinburgh, Southampton and Sheffield prior to taking up her chair of law at Newcastle University. Lynn is heavily involved in academic research and the production of papers and articles. She's the editor and major author of Law Policy and the Internet, one of the leading textbooks in the field, and she won the Future of Privacy Forum Award in 2019 for Best Paper, Slave to the Algorithm, written with Michael Veal. She's a partner of the Horizon Digital Economy Hub at Nottingham, the lead for the Alan Turing Institute on Law and AI, a fellow of the Institute on the Future of Work, and is a recognised expert in European intermediary liability and the e-commerce directive. Welcome, Lillian. We also have, to provide us with a legal view, from the technology industry and a leading supplier of IT services, we have Anita Shaw. Anita is an IP counsel for IBM UK, having previously trained in general sciences and then computer science. Anita is dual qualified European and UK patent attorney and has a wide ranging experience in protecting and harvesting of IP and monetizing the same through collaboration and licensing transactions. She works regularly in the fields of policy advice, cybersecurity, data, AI and copyrights across the EU and the UK and involved, as involved in a number of external organisations um, to IBM, including the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys, the IP Federation, which represents the views of UK industry um, in the IPR policy matters, and IP, IP Inclusive, which is working to make IP professionals more equal, diverse and inclusive. So welcome, Anita. We also have Toby, Toby Hedden. Toby is a senior associate at Bristow's in the Brands, Designs and Copyright team. He has handled a wide range of IP disputes at all levels, including within the EU Court of Justice and the UK Supreme Court. His most recent work includes advising clients regarding online licensing, data mining, natural language processing and AI, internet indexing, online publishing and exhaustion of rights. Toby will also be leading the panel discussion here where all the panelists will be involved and uh, Claudio, that's prior, just after Claudio has demystified technology for us. And after we've had a little run through of where we are on the regulatory basis. And in order to kick us off with that, we have Charlie, Charlie Hawes. Now Charlie is a senior associate in the commercial IT team here at Bristow's and he advises clients on a wide range of commercial and regulatory issues. This includes advising on commercial IT agreements, advising LLMs as they roll out across the UK and Europe, AI and machine learning. So the running order is Charlie is going to talk us through a regulatory snapshot of all things legal. Um, Claudio is then going to help us demystify the technologies behind LLMs and what they are. There'll be a quick refreshment break and then the panel discussion. There will be space for questions after the end of each segment and if you look at your seats you have mics next to you and if you press the button next to the mic, the big sort of oval button, that will light up in red and that will give you the ability to speak to the auditorium. So uh, when we ask, good luck on that one. Don't press it and leave it on and then have lots of whispering. So that might be very discouraging to all of us. Um, if you are going to ask a question, please just ask a question and not provide a five minute observation on things. If you, if you would like to talk to um, the panelists and anyone really, they, we, we have drinks and canapes afterwards so you can indulge these guys and indulge yourself to your heart's content at that stage. And on that note, Charlie, would you like to lead us off please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Bristow's. Um, it really does seem as if we might be living through one of those moments in technology that comes along every once uh, in, in a while. For technology lawyers like Chris and I, the last six months or so since ChatGPT was launched has been uh, you know, uh, an incredible time uh, just watching the, uh, the, the frenzy of activity and excitement around uh, generative AI um, and what the opportunities 
uh, and indeed disruptive impacts uh, might be. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to uh, start by briefly explaining uh, what we mean by large language models and, and generative AI. Uh, Claudio is going to be doing uh, a deeper technical dive uh, in his presentation, so I'm not going to go that far in terms of explaining what's going on under the hood. In fact, I'm not going to go there at all. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the legal and regulatory risks that seem to be crystallizing around generative AI. I, I was just chatting to Lillian, and, and there are about five or six issues that um, seem to be now um, coming into focus as being particularly germane to, um, to, to generative AI. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the regulatory, regulatory responses uh, such as we have them you know, so far. Um, uh, I've called this presentation a snapshot because you know, really that's all it can be given how fast things are moving. Um, and we're still really only on the cusp of the changes that large language models are going to bring and regulators and, and, and legislators uh, are still very much um, thinking this through and, and, and indeed racing to, to catch up. And so hopefully what my presentation uh, is going to do is to just sort of tee up some of the issues um, which uh, will then be discussed in more detail during the panel, uh, the pa the panel discussion. So what do we mean when we refer to generative AI uh, or uh, multimodal large language models or foundation models, um, as they're also sometimes referred to? Uh, we're talking about a new generation of machine learning algorithmic models that are built and trained on a vast scale that can generate high quality content like text, images, code, um, all from that a natural language text prompt provided by uh, the user. Um, at their simplest, these models are designed to predict the next word in a sentence by deriving statistical patterns in language after being trained on massive data sets of billions of words uh, and, and, and images, uh, much of it scraped from the public internet. But it turns out that this ability to predict the next word in a sentence is uh, extraordinarily powerful and can be very easily repurposed for solving lots of other tasks um, that were not included in the uh, training uh, examples provided to, the, provided to these models, like document summarization, uh, language translation, uh, writing software code, dialogue, arithmetic, geometry, and so on. And the same principles that are used in the large language models mean that, mean that uh, they can also operate in other modalities like images and sound. Um, and I think it's impossible to overemphasize, particularly in terms of the timescales that legislators tend to operate in, how quickly this is all happening. Uh, most of the products that we're talking about today um, as hopefully you can just kind of pick up from the slide there, uh, are, are less than a year old. And, it, and incredible as that is, I think it's also important to understand that the place we're in right now with GPT-4 and other capable LLMs largely sitting behind APIs at half a dozen or so big technology organisations you know, is not going to last for long um, and isn't the scenario that, in fact, you know, we in the legal uh, risk and compliance community kind of need to uh, think through because there is a whole wave of products and innovation that's coming towards us that's kind of already baked in and inevitable given the capabilities of this technology. Um, I think... It's those that are going to make this technology much more tangible um, uh, and mean that it will start to find its way into most enterprise organisations in a very short period of time. So just to pick out uh, a few of the examples on the slide here, um, both Google Workspace and Microsoft uh, Office will have generative AI baked into them um, later this year. So... 
uh, that's generative AI at the fingertips of an existing user base of billions of people within, say, six months from now. Uh, GPT-4 has a capability which hasn't been fully uh, released yet, which is to work with a 32,000 token context window, which is the equivalent of 24,000 words or 50 pages of single spaced text. You know, imagine what that is going to do for document summarization and document analysis use cases. Um, it's going to be a very tempting product to buy for all kinds of professional services uh, or organizations. And then fine-tuning uh, LLMs on enterprise data sets. Basically, every organization having their own LLM trained on their data that can, that can speak to their issues and their know-how. Um, that's going to be, I think, a very big product area um, and one that uh, is likely to end up on the desk of many, um, many in-house lawyers um, in the not too a distant, distant future. So for lawyers uh, and kind of compliance folk more generally, what challenges does generative AI bring? Um, these are the ones that are emerging as more salient to generative AI. Of course, there are others um, like bias, for example, um, relating to a AI more generally, but, but these are the ones that are uh, particularly uh, emerging now around generative AI. Um, in some respects, it's kind of an interesting moment because uh, these are all legal conundrums that have been long associated with AI that have previously perhaps been something more of an academic um, uh, area of focus, but are now actually manifesting for the first time as proper disputes and as regulatory interventions. Um, and some of these, you know, I, I, I don't want to... Um, you know, let's not kind of uh, undersell this. I mean, you know, some of these problems, you know, may be very difficult to solve. And, and certainly at the outset, I was uh, just chatting to Lillian beforehand, she used the, the word existential. You know, um, some of these issues are going to push legislation to uh, its absolute limits, um, unless legislators and policymakers, particularly in the EU, are prepared to very significantly impair or call a halt to the deployment of this technology. Okay, so the first one is, is, is IPR. Uh, Toby will discuss this with the panel. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna kind of tee up what the, what the issues and, and questions are rather than get into a real uh, kind of unpacking of, 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 of the IPR positions because it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty involved. But the copyright infringement risks um, associated with generative AI are generally des described now in terms of input risk and output risk. Input risk is all about the uh, copyright infringement risk relating to the accessing, storing and analysing of third party data by AI developers for the purpose of creating data sets to train a large language model and for the actual training itself. Um, and the legal questions revolve around the extent to which this collection and training process uh, infringes copyright in the works in those uh, data sets. Of course, some of, some of those works will be in the public domain or otherwise permissively licensed, um, but many won't. Exceptions, of course, might also apply. In the US, there is a fair use exception, and a lot of commentators are discussing uh, the well-known uh, Google Books case as a potentially helpful precedent for, for AI developers uh, there. Um, in the EU, the UK and some other jurisdictions, most obviously there are text and data mining exceptions. So Article 4 of the Digital Single Market Directive, which creates an exception for text and data mining purposes for commercial organisations, provided that they have lawful access to the work and that the rights holders um, haven't reserved their rights out of the exception. Um, the UK IPO last year uh, proposed to broaden the UK's TDM exception very broadly. And although this reform seems to have been halted after objections from publishers and other rights holders, the UK government uh, still seems to be set on finding a way of creating a more permissive regime in the UK for text uh, and data mining when compared to the, the EU. 
Uh, there was a report published last month by Sir Patrick Valance suggesting a code of practice for TDM in the UK, which Toby will discuss with the panel later. Output risk is about whether the content generated by the model is an infringing adaption or derivative work uh, of the works in the training data set. Whilst it has been shown that some items in the training data sets can be reproduced more or less verbatim by the trained model, uh, it's critical to understand that these models do not work by memorising or referencing a copy of what's in their data sets, but by statistical relationships that are learned through training on billions of, of words and images. And, and all these issues are central to the cases that are up on, uh, up on, the, up on the slide here. Um, I think it's also uh, interesting to uh, acknowledge that there is a kind of commercial response, a kind of adaption in the market that's already happening around the uh, data set infringement issue. So uh, last week, um, Reddit and Stack Exchange, which are two websites which it's been known um, have been, if you like, very heavily mined in previous large training runs of language models. Um, both of them have come out saying that they uh, are creating um, uh, new API licenses, which is basically means that from now on, AI developers are going to have to come and pay license fees in order to do um, uh, text and data mining uh, for of their data for, um, for, 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 for training purposes. There was a, a US news publisher who came out uh, again last week uh, and, and, and said something similar. So, you know, it may be that the days of um, large scale scraping of the internet um, will find itself uh, kind of happening, if you like, almost under the radar, will kind of find itself um, in decline simply by the market being more alive to the commercial, uh, if you like, opportunities available there for, 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 for rights holders. Okay, so um, privacy, right? So because large language models have been trained in part on uh, billions of words collected from the public internet, it follows that some of those words are personal information about living individuals. Um, of course, almost no one has any awareness at all that their personal information um, on the public internet may have been used for training large language models. Um, and it was this issue that the Italian data protection regulator seized on last month when it ordered a, a temporary ban of, uh, of ChatGPT, which I, I think has now been lifted. Um, AI developers subject to GDPR and similar legislation are faced with a requirement to provide notice to these individuals whose data is being processed. Um, there is in the GDPR uh, an exception from providing notice which proves impossible or involves a disproportionate effort. I think it'll be interesting to see how many uh, LLM developers seek to rely on this exception and how they approach describing the, pr the processing activities in their privacy notices. Legal basis for processing is, a, is another fundamental question. What legal basis does an AI developer have under the GDPR for the processing of personal data that is included in the uh, training data sets? One of the GDPR grounds, legitimate interests, is now being talked about as a possible answer to this, um, which requires a controller to undertake a balancing test uh, to weigh up the interests of the data subjects with that of the developer. Um, the question turning on whether the processing presents a high risk to the rights and freedoms uh, of data subjects. Another critical area is allowing data subjects copies of their personal data and the right to rectify inaccurate data and erase it in some circumstances. And, and this one, I think, is particularly difficult. How can this possibly be achieved in relation to a model that has billions uh, of, of parameters, perhaps by blocking its output in some kind of targeted way? There isn't uh, an obvious or, or, or easy solution uh, to this. And I think given the interest that data protection regulators are taking this technology, I think we'll see proposed, to the proposed solutions to these issues over the coming months from OpenAI and other developers and then it, it'll be up to the regulatory authorities to decide where to strike the, the balance between data subject rights 
and the ongoing use of training data. So misinformation. Um, so this is the Pope at, at the Burning Man Festival and, um, and also someone anticipating what Donald Trump's arrest might have looked like, um, though, of course, he, uh, when he was arrested, it didn't happen quite in the way that's you know, depicted, depicted here. Um, so misinformation, this, was, this is all about deceptive and human-like um, synthetic content. Um, generative AI makes it easier to produce fake news and all kinds of misinformation at a scale and to a degree of realism um, that uh, has never been seen before. Um, it's possible, for example, to imagine models being able to produce spam um, or phishing emails individually tailored to hundreds of thousands or even millions of people uh, very quickly and at a very low cost. Uh, it's going to be faster and cheaper to produce incredibly lifelike fake digital humans, chatbots, synthetic voices and other audio, and also fake or pho photographs and film that is ind indistinguishable or nearly indistinguishable indis from the real thing. Um, obviously, this has got all kinds of potential for misuse, so not just scams, but producing propaganda or other deceptive content. Um, and I think since the emergence of deepfakes a few years back, this has been an area that was already in the mix in the EU's AI Act and in other legislation. But it's going to come, I expect, even further up the agenda now. Um, and probably of all of the issues that we're talking about now, it will be the most kind of objectively straightforward to legislate for, um, but obviously very difficult to, to stamp out in practice. Um, and I think ha you know, whichever way we go, this is just inevitably going to cause a lot of trouble and take you know, us as a society um, a while to kind of adjust adjust to. So hallucination is the term that's been adopted by the uh, machine learning community to describe the propensity of text-to-text uh, -text large language models to generate incorrect facts to, to make stuff up. Um, it's a particularly troublesome characteristic because the hallucinations are often extremely plausible um, and hard to spot and tend to come intermixed with factually correct content. Um, this issue has made the uh, headlines on several occasions recently. For example, a mayor of a small town in Australia had threatened defamation proceedings after uh, ChatGPT stated he had served time in prison uh, for, for bribery. And there is even a term now called hallucitations, which refers to the fake uh, citations that the uh, ChatGPT and other models will sometimes include when asked to um, list peer-reviewed work. And the problem of hallucinations goes right to the heart, I think, of what large language models do technically and the potential disconnect between um, users and the technology. So text-to-text -text LLMs are generating statistically likely <coughs> strings of words, not constructing correct factual statements by referencing indexed data sets. Um, the problem is, I think, is that most user users still don't really um, understand the difference between those two things. And the latest models like GPT-4 um, are now so good at language that they do get the facts right a lot of the time. Um, and are also, I think, you know, our, our innate human tendency to anthropomorphize things that seem human-like um, means people are more likely to trust a large language model that produces apparently authoritative content even when uh, it's actually wrong. Um, as you'd expect, this is a high-priority research area um, to solve for OpenAI uh, and others. It also seems to be the case that fine-tuning the LLMs uh, on smaller data sets reduces the hallucination rate. But, you know, it is a massive problem, um, especially, I think, for enterprise users who want to be able to rely on the output of LLMs. Um, I'd actually go as far as to say that for most people in the audience, this is probably the most immediate and pressing issue with um, LLMs. Uh, as from what we're seeing advising clients, 
Uh, you will all have employees uh, who are already using GPT and similar tools uh, in your, in your organisations. Uh, and so there's an obvious risk that people are going to start uh, relying uh, on incorrect facts or having incorrect information kind of creep into, uh, creep into organ organisations um, as, a, as, a, as a result. So alignment and safety. Um, so up on the screen here are the questions that OpenAI's GPT-4 model provided detailed answers to before it underwent a six-month safety evaluation effort to try to ensure that the actual deployed operational model uh, didn't provide answers to questions uh, like these. Um, I have taken these from the GPT-4 system card. So if you want to see how the model did respond to them before it was successfully fine-tuned to refuse to answer them, um, you can go and find that on the, the OpenAI uh, website. Uh, I should kind of pick, w pick one issue out. There is a particular concern around um, chemical weapons, know-how, dual use risk, as it, it's called in the uh, kind of sanctions regime world, um, as uh, these uh, more sophisticated models do display um, some kind of uh, uh, domain knowledge of chemical synthesis and, and other things that, are, that could be useful for devising um, weapons of mass destruction and, 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 other, um, and other bombs and so on. Um, the fact that GPT-4 could answer these questions um, quite uh, efficiently of, co of course also begs the question of what the, what the next generation of very large language models will, will be able to do um, and also of course how long it will be before a model with the power of GPT-4 will be made available by somebody that hasn't been through a safety evaluation process. And I think if um, OpenAI hadn't put GPT-4 through uh, a safety evaluation phase and users could now get answers to these kinds of questions from ChatGPT uh, very easily or, or albeit without running um, very sophisticated jailbreaks, then I would submit to you that the topic of safety and alignment would be much higher up the policy agenda um, than it is. Um, and uh, as OpenAI themselves have acknowledged and discussed, um, we've now reached the point where um, these kinds of issues uh, do, need to be, um, do need to be discussed. And it was um, that that prompted uh, the moratorium letter that you'll have heard about that was published last month by the Future of Life Institute in the US calling for a pause on training of models larger than GPT-4 for six months. Um, and of course there was a lot of cynicism about the motivations behind some of the signatories in the letter as clearly you know, it is of commercial benefit of some technology companies potentially that are trailing behind in the AI arms race to have a six month pause to help them catch up. Um, and there's also a, a, a kind of recurrent uh, critique of uh, some in the large language model space um, that uh, all too often the, uh, the conversation that you hear uh, from leaders in the uh, machine learning space around these issues uh, are all about the more kind of highfalutin, hypothetical risks to do with artificial general intelligence and uh, uh, dangerous super intelligent uh, machines kind of emerging and, and, and taking over, um, uh, whereas the focus really should be on the much more kind of proximate um, and day-to-day -day risks of the kind that we've been, 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 discuss been discussing so far. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, critique that this letter in some respects can be seen as a kind of bait and switch and not the kind of, um, uh, and, and, and aren't the kind of issues, doesn't present the kind of issues that, that we really need to be worried about. But I, th I think the, uh, the safety um, uh, 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 potential uh, implications of, of models like GPT-4 having, if you like, dangerous knowledge um, is a very significant one. Uh, and you know, uh, hopefully, it won't take some kind of incident uh, occurring for um, for governments to 
uh, to sit up and take take a bit more take a bit more notice. And I'm I'm frankly a bit surprised that uh, that this letter is the only uh, really organised collective response around this issue that we've seen we've seen so far. Um, so let's look at some of the early legislative responses to generative AI. Um, when I first committed to giving this presentation a couple of months ago, we actually didn't have that much input. <laughs> there wasn't much to say. Um, but happily, over the last four or five weeks, um, that's starting to change. Um, but you know, I can't emphasise enough that we're still only on the, on the cusp of legislators, regulators, and, uh, uh, and others kind of starting to scramble to catch up with large language models and, and, and make um, interventions. Um, so uh, let's um, look at the EU's AI Act first. So um, the emergence of these kinds of very powerful models that can be adapted to different tasks presents a particular difficulty for legislation like the AI Act which is um, designed around regulating high-risk use cases. So the problem being that if an LLM can be adapted for um, can be adapted for high-risk cases, do you regulate the model only at that di downstream point of of high-risk use, or uh, at the outset during its development and training, even though it may never subsequently be used for a high-risk uh, purpose? And it's that conundrum that has been holding up the EU's Draft AI Act in Brussels over the last couple of months, as EU Parliament has been kind of ferociously debating uh, between itself um, on how to agree on new provisions to add to the draft text of the Act relating to LLMs or general purpose AI systems, as, a, as they're now called in the draft text. Um, the draft proposals haven't been made public yet, but apparently include placing various testing and quality control measures on the developers uh, of multimodal large language models, um, and also downstream providers will have to produce comprehensive quality assurance and risk assessment documentation um, on the model. Uh, these proposals are actually going to be voted on tomorrow, um, and if they go through, trial of negotiations between the three institutions will start very quickly with a view to agreeing and publishing a finalised text before, before the end of the year. So do, do keep an eye on the AI Act. Um, it's probably going to start moving uh, quicker than it, than, 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 than it has done. But, it, but, it's, but just standing back, I mean, it's, it's, and going back to the speed with which all of this is happening, it's, you know, what's essentially happened here is that the most comprehensive piece of AI legislation in the world um, has essentially been caught blindsided, sort of mid-flight through its gestation process um, by generative AI, um, and it's having to be rewritten on the fly to try to accommodate um, the rise of generative AI, which wasn't anticipated at all two years ago when it was when it was it was it was it was first published. So that's I think that's a real kind of lesson to, uh, to, to take away here. Um, I'm just going to look at Chris to tell me, he's saying I've got two minutes. OK, so I will very quickly talk about China and the UK. Um, so China, they, they have a couple of weeks ago produced a, a draft policy for generative AI. Putting aside the authoritarian aspects of that, um, it's actually uh, a, a, a pr uh, a very uh, focused uh, document that really does target all of the issues that we have been discussing today, including you know, quasi-GDPR type privacy protections um, and rights for users, uh, and including very uh, robust statements around IP infringement. So um, you know, China is kind of very much taking this, this seriously. Uh, for the UK, um, as you're probably aware, the UK has already positioned itself as taking a very kind of pro-innovation uh, approach to AI regulation in general. Uh, the government sees AI uh, policy uh, as a place to exploit um, the Bre uh, 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 kind of Brexit dividend and, and put uh, 
clear water between us and, us and Europe. Um, I, I think what's interesting now is uh, if you've got the EU and China and others taking generative AI uh, much more seriously and generative AIs, if you like, turning up the dial slightly on uh, the risks relating to AI, I think it, the UK approach now seems even more of an outlier and it'll be interesting to see whether the government um, kind of uh, continues, con con continues um, its current uh, trajectory. And then, you know, finally, I just kind of thought we'd sort of, um, after all of that flurry of information, just kind of get, come back, come to the beach. So this is, this is Orville Wright, just lifted off in the Kitty Hawk um, on a beach in North Carolina the week before Christmas, 120 years ago. And, you know, I, I, I'm genuinely not sure whether it's hyperbole to draw a comparison between that moment and the moment we're in now. Um, you know, is this, is generative AI something like the invention of powered flight or of, or of nuclear weapons? You know, it's a technology that poses profound legal questions, that is very disruptive and transformative, that's low cost and will be readily accessible by at least hundreds of millions of people um, before before the end of the year. And um, I look forward to the panel giving us their thoughts um, on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, having promised you questions at the end of each segment, I'm now, with the power invested in me as chair, taking that away. <laughs> And, but if you have questions for Charlie um, around all this subject matter, then Charlie will sure. be outside with drinks and canapes. But what we're going to do is briefly, as we quickly move on, Claudio, you if you'd like to take the stage and now let us know what is all of this stuff. Can you explain it to us? I, I, uh, yeah, I hope You're so. a good man. I'm not you like very your much. last slide. <laughs> I am a nervous flyer. Knowing that we've been flying for just under the years makes me very nervous. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brissos, for inviting me. I am Claudio Calvino. I'm a partner at FTI. My specialty is uh, data science. Uh, why I'm here today? I'm here today to have a chat about large language models. What are they? How do they work? Limitations and applications. Uh, I added the word busy to the title because my life is very busy now because of what's happening around with large language models. Uh, I run a quick analysis over the weekend and I focus on 10% of the discussion happening around large language models on fora, blogs, uh, newspaper and social media. And you can see how the discussion picked up in the last uh, few months and weeks. Uh, main peaks were triggered by three events, which is reported performances of GPT-4, uh, the letter that Charlie just mentioned before, and this continuous activity aimed to you know, uh, overcoming the limitations that GPTs uh, have now. There's also a very fun discussion, less uh, interesting maybe, happening on social, uh, triggered by people that believe we, will, you know, we are doomed, AI will take over. I am redundant. You know, as you might know, uh, but still we do have, there is a lot of interest around, around the large language models. Before we get into them, let's set the scene with few definitions. Uh, the first one is AI. What is AI? AI is very much uh, machines that act in a way that they seem human. I'm not going to go through all of them, but everything else, NLP, machine learning, deep learning, uh, LLM and GPTs, they are just a subset of AI. Large language models are very big machine learning models that have been trained on huge amount of corpora and uh, can create human-like text. GPTs, that are generally pre-trained transformers, are a specific kind of LLM that use a, a technology called transformer. If you imagine Google Translate, you have your input, which is the sentence that you want to translate, and then you have your your output, which is the translated sentences, this is what the transformer is. Encoder, decoder, transformer sit in the middle. Uh, where are we now? All the industry, no matter what you read around, is doing narrow AI, weak AI, which is we can train machine learning models that can do one thing very well, only one. Even ChatGPT does one thing very well, and we will see what is this thing. 
we are going very quickly now in the direction of general AI, which is a machine that can perform very well against unfamiliar tasks. We train the machine to do something, the machine can do something else. That is coming. I don't know if I will still be alive when this will come, but what will happen? I hope so. Super AI, which is this idea of machine that can outperform us and that can feel, can understand feelings the way we understand them, is just fiction. It's not going to happen anytime soon. So what are large language models? How do they work? We can divide in three main steps. The first one is the pre-training. It's when I train a large language model on a very huge, a very, a huge amount of uh, data, and I don't do that telling the machine what the machine needs to learn. The machine does not know what to learn. What the machine does is looking for patterns, is looking for uh, the structure of the language, is creating uh, a different language, a mathematical representation of the language it itself. Then there is the fine tuning process. The fine tuning process happens in a way where I tell the machine what to learn. This is a supervised approach. Yes, no, true, false, right, wrong, or out this question answering uh, kind of approach that we have learned to know with GPTs. Uh, and finally, there is the, the inference. The inference is when I provide the machine with new data, data that has that have never been seen by the machine, or where I challenge the machine with a new prompt, and I expect the machine to solve for this prompt. So these are the three main steps. Uh, how do they create new content? And is that really new content? Well, what the machine does is a probabilistic approach. What the machine does is guessing the next word. When I create a prompt, what the machine does, the machine runs and creates a list of words that are ranked by likelihood to be the right one, the right one to complete the prompt, the one with the highest probability is picked, and then is fed back into the machine. The machine runs again and again and again. It's guessing what is the next word. Nothing more than that. Is the content new? Well, the content is not really new because it has been already seen somehow by the machine training on huge amount of data, there is no database behind it. So what is new is a new way of creating content, which sounds very much like someone, a human, has been writing it because it has been trained on corpora that have been written by humans. So why these machines are so powerful in the end? What is the reason why they are so powerful? So they are based on a technology that has been uh, um, published in 2017, which is a, a transformer. Uh, what they do, they are uh, trained on huge amount of data. OK, fine, but it's not that new. We know about large language models since 2018. BERT was one of the first. I think it's a Google BERT. And uh, then um, Excelnet and, and Roberta, we have been using this model even at FTI, we've been using models you know, for last five years. So why now? Why are they are so powerful now? Because now they have a lot more, uh, a lot of more, a lot more parameters. Sorry. A and what is a parameter? A parameter, we can think about a parameter as a piece of information that the machine owns, the machine as about a specific language. So more parameters, the more we can expect the machine to be effective and to be precise. So why now? Because when the first large language model was released, they had 340 million parameters, which is a lot. Uh, Chat GPT-3, so sorry, GPT-3, that is already a few years old, had 175 billion parameters. GPT-4 is expected to have trillion, a trillion parameters. So you can see how having more parameters means knowing more about the structure of the language and being more, more proficient at uh, solving problems that are language problems. So why now again? Because now we have the computational power to do so. Because we made uh, very good progresses in other fields uh, that allow us to, to, to compute better. Um, each one of these models takes now weeks to train. It was taking months before to train. How do we evaluate these models? Well, there are specific metrics like blue and so on that are more technical. But what we have learned, this is maybe part of the problem, part of the, 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 um, the problem that, that we have now, is very much that we are learning to measure the performances of these models against tasks that have been designed by humans, and if not by humans, for humans. So this plot comes from um, 
OpenAI's website and is reporting the performances of three GPT's model against very known exams. And you can see how uh, the more the developers uh, come up with new parameters, bigger model, better model, the performances go up. Uh, so this is the way we now measure how this model really, really work. Uh, what specifically chat GPT-3, sorry, GPT-3, I keep confusing, GPT-3 is the model, chat GPT-3 is the application, just to be sure, um, has been trained on. The, they, they use five uh, data sets, and you can find this information uh, just, just by Googling it. The first one is content scraped uh, from the internet in the last uh, 15 years. The second one is Web Text View, which is um, a specific data set created by OpenAI and is based on, on Reddit. The third and fourth are two uh, collections of books that are available online. And the fourth one is Wikipedia. So already by looking at what has been used to train the model, you can start seeing what are the limitations of the model. Uh, sure, they can get hallucinated, they can come up with wrong answers, but this is going to pass in the future. The main problem is bias. These models are created, so the bias is not, the model is not biased per se or in se, the model is biased because the data is biased. The data is biased because we are humans and we are biased, no matter what we do. Uh, if we are biased, we create biased content and then that content is used by the machine to learn how we speak, what we say, how we build uh, our own text. Um, the problem is that the machine can deploy this bias at a scale that is difficult to mitigate. So if you look at the, the map, that map that comes from 2014 is not very recent, but still I think it's very interesting. Uh, the map comes from a study that was run by the Oxford Internet Institute uh, in the period where I was there, even though I was not part of this, of this specific study. Uh, and what it's showing is the number of edits, the Wikipedia edits, for each single, for each 10,000 users. So the, 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 the darker the color, uh, the higher the number of edits by country. What that means? means that most of the content that you find in, in Wikipedia has been edited in, in, in some countries. And you can read the map the way you want, but there is bias there, which means that what has been written about places, about events, about facts, has been written by, you know, by sitting in a specific part of the world and by having a particular perspective of that specific place, event, and fact. And if we use this data to train the model, then we reproduce the bias. We know that, that we are biased, so we try to mitigate that. The machine does not have any idea that is bias, and this is the problem. So there are, there are ways to mitigate that. We can work on the data, which is by augmenting the data, fixing the data, creating scenarios where there is less bias, uh, or we can work at the end of, of the pipeline, which is very much before presenting the, the data, the results, to the user. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a difficult task. And the difference between uh, 3.5 3 and 4, or GPT-3, uh, 3.5 and 4, is also in that, is the machine, they build more parachutes around it. So where are we going? What are the, 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 future, the future applications? So I, once again, I think we have, we have, we have uh, experienced this, this, this period by recreating the, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is very much that happens when someone is not skilled, and this lack of skill uh, generates a, a kind of the feeling that they know about something, and they tend to, over, to overestimate their, their capability and competencies in this specific field. We did the same with ChatGPT. Uh, we did the same with large language models. We started, and when they came, uh, we thought that they were going to solve everything, and we were redundant, and we were just going to be uh, um, useless. And as uh, someone on Twitter was saying, uh, and then we started knowing more about large language models. We started understanding more about them. And we started understanding more about the limitations. And the, the moment we gained knowledge, we lost confidence in them. Uh, where we're going to settle, I think, in the future, and uh, I do, I'm, I'm not the only one that is saying that, uh, hopefully, is very much in a more balanced place where we will have enough knowledge about the model 
we will have enough knowledge about their limitations, what they can do, what they cannot do, so that we can use them. Uh, there are already a lot of examples, because they are not new, because they've been around since you know, the last five years at least, there are already a huge amount of examples where large language models have been useful. Uh, and maybe even in activities that you run, or you're a part of, uh, from healthcare finance and customer service and, and, and business transformation and supply chain optimization and so on and so forth. Uh, when it comes to the legal uh, sector, I did ask uh, GPT to help me with that. And I asked for the two, two top examples of applications applied to the five main areas where AI is relevant when it comes to the legal sector. Now, I, I agree, there is no way e-discovery tools can avoid uh, leveraging these kind of models. Uh, for sure, they are going to be super helpful in helping the expert in producing content, reviewing content, editing content. Uh, but the, most, the two most interesting areas, I think, is the last two, which is very much predictive analytics, that is being able to uh, understand or to predict the likelihood of winning uh, a case or, or to... to, to um, to identify trends that we can leverage. And the last one, that is, I think, what you all are going to see in the next few years, is for this tool to become part of your daily life. Uh, the brands here come from me, not from the machine, and I added Copilot, that is Windows Copilot, in my... Um, uh, and uh, the way I see that working is very much for Copilot and uh, these kind of tools to become part of our daily, daily experience. That is what happened already with, for example, with Google, with uh, search engines a few years ago, or with the internet. The way we add value and the way we will add value uh, to our activities is going to change. It's going to change also because of this model. So just to... to uh, wrap up, and I think I've been shorter than I should have been. I have 15 minutes, so I, I, I can start from the beginning again, <laughs> and I can try again to be sure. I will have questions. So, just maybe to make sure that, that we align what they are. They are big, uh, large models. They do not understand the semantic. They know very well the syntax. They are trained or big amount of data, and what they are very good at, they are very good at learning, uh, at guessing the next word, guessing the one word that comes after the one that has been provided with. Is an innovation, yes, is a huge innovation, for sure. Is it gonna change the world the way we know it? Well, no, not yet. Uh, I'm gonna go to the conclusion, but then I expect questions, please, otherwise I'm going to be very short, and that's not going to look like in camera. Uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are good models. They have limitations. There is no way that by stopping the development of these models, we're going to solve anything. Uh, what is needed is very much to ask for transparency and to ask for openness and to ask for fairness in the way these models are, are, are developed. Uh, there are two main innovations that are coming. One is multimodal input. The first one is very much the capability for the machine to deal with input that comes that come in different format. Now we can only provide the machine with text. Uh, GPT-4 is going to be able to use audio and video, which is I can write a prompt and I can expect the machine to come up with an image or something like that. The other one, which I think it's, it's more interesting, and I was saving that for the panel, but maybe it's the right time now, is something that does not come from OpenAI, and is um, AutoGPT, uh, and is the capability for different large language models to work together and to have access to the internet. So, and that comes from people like me and you that have been coding uh, in their offices. And that means that the two, large, the two, three large language models can challenge each other, can improve each other. And then by giving them agent access to Google, they can research and they can improve. So this is happening now. 
uh, and, and this is happening you know, just a few months later, the large models were released. I am done. If you have any question, please, I'm here for you. Claudia, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, stay, keep staying up there. I'll see you. And I'll take um, I need to get on here so the camera sees me. But, um, Thank you, Claudia. Do, does anyone have any questions for Claudia? And if you just, again, press the button uh, so that it lights up red on your microphone and you will be heard in the auditorium. Thanks for the presentation. I think one of the questions that you raised was the data that's being fed into the large language models and some of the issues around that data. And you mentioned that potentially open data could be a solution. There's already been sort of a push within the open source community for open data. How do you see those two things fitting together? Well, I, I don't think, so okay, I, I think that the bias is there to stay. Uh, the, 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 the data is, is already, as I think Charlie was saying, they, they, they scrape and there's a huge amount of data that was collected. Uh, in order for us to have unbiased models, we need to have unbiased data. So our open data is not gonna be the solution. The solution is to control the data that are fed to the machine. Uh, the, 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 the more countermeasures we build around that, the easier it is to have, to have unbiased models. Um, we do a lot, we, we focus a lot on that in our uh, daily life to try to, to, to assess bias in the model. And this, it's never uh, because of the engineer that made a mistake or because the machine, it's just because of the data that are fed it. Open data, you know, having, having, having data that are there to be used is still a risk. It's quantity, it might be no quality. Does it answer your question? Yes, thanks. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was curious around um, what you were talking about transparency. What would transparency look like if you can't reverse engineer an answer, um, say when LMs advance even further? Well, I, I think transparency means, for example, publishing the way you have building your model. Uh, there are papers for GPT-3s, and, and, and I, could, I could check the information with what are they trained on, and it's not always like that. Uh, transparency is being transparent on the data that has been used. Uh, is to, to make sure that it's, it's clear what is you know, the scope that they have, and you know, what are the countermeasures that they're using. Uh, it's, it's, it's maybe finding the right balance between IP and the need of making money, uh, also the fact that you know they are so big of an innovation that cannot be kept just for a few people because they are they are <coughs> this is one of these moments in my field where the world has changed and cannot be just a few actors that own it. Uh, cool. Yes, sir. There you go. Oh. Is that working? Oh, great. Yes. I, I just wanted the beer, if that's, if that's okay. <laughs> um, no, my, 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 my question was around, um, you mentioned a lot about training the model and the quality of the output would depend on the quality of the data and, uh, and how well it's trained. What does training the model look like from a practical perspective? Is it more sort of like reviewing responses and assigning whether this is a right response and a, this is a wrong response type thing? Like bottle wine, very good question, I like that. So it's, it's the training that we, the way we used to train is supervised or unsupervised. Supervised happens, for example, when I'm teaching a machine to recognize if it's a dog or a cat. So I provide the machine with a thousand images of a dog, and they are all one, and a thousand images of a cat, and they are all zero. So the machine learns how, what are the differences in a picture between dog and cats, and then if I provide them a, mach a picture of a dog, the machine should be able to tell me, oh yeah, it's a dog, well done. Uh, the unsupervised approach is when I don't tell the machine what to, what, what to learn. Uh, maybe I provide the machine with a, um, a number of emails and the machine is just looking for patterns in the data uh, and then the machine is gonna tell me uh, what are the topics, uh, what is the sentiment, uh, what are those emails talking about, uh, if that specific entity was mentioned or not, so the difference is very much the way we train machines is very much in these two different ways. Then there are layers of complexity that, that, that do make all of that possible, uh, but the two main approaches are 
uh, supervise. So I know what to tell the machine and what machine needs to learn. And unsupervised, I just ask the machine to learn about the data and come back to me. Thank you. Great. Yes. So, uh, Hannah, I, just, I did yeah. very well in bashing. I think good. Yeah, well, you get two questions. He gets two beers. So, uh, <laughs> Hannah. <laughs> I was just wondering, a lot of the language you're using is still very sort of anthropomorphic, like I tell the machine and supervised and unsupervised and that sort of thing. And I was wondering if maybe we need a new way of talking about it or if people are thinking about it that way, because it still feels like we all act as if the machines are, it's very matrix style. It's very like these are these machines are things, they are sentient, for, just in for, the whole way for, our language for us, is. For us, they are. Unfortunately, for us, they are. For some of the spends, I ate. 10 hours coding on me anymore, but guys, no, what, the reason why I'm here is because my, my team could not leave the office. So they don't like the daily light. <laughs> they just code all the day. So for, it's, 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 yeah, for sure, this is a very interesting point, but you're right at the point where they, they are part of your life and you do identify, you do, you do humanize them. And also, no, we as species, we do humanize humans. I talk to my dog like it's a kid. And I do the same, no, and we do the same with, with, with machines. In particular, when you have machines that are so, so, so advanced that they sound like humans in the end. So I, I agree, I don't think it's gonna happen, at least not in my, in my field. But it's a very good point. Still a machine. Still a machine. Yeah. Sir, a sir, and then the lady just down in front. So, sir, would you go, go first? Yeah. Yeah, um, press your button. Not your Should be uh, <laughs> loud enough. <laughs> is, that, is that better? It's much better. <laughs> right, so um, so yeah, with the current situation with LMMs and the, and the data that's needed to train them, is this kind of a temporary issue, as you see it, until AI reaches a point where it can synthetically create the data to test its own, you know, logic and, and application? Or is this a problem that we're going to have to live with indefinitely? Do you think there's always going to need to be that, that real data to... To, to no, no, train, no, we, yeah. we already have synthetic data. We already, we already have processes that can create synthetic data. They start from, you know, the starting point is a distribution of real world data and they can trade their own data. And I, there, are, there are applications of, you know, data that are built and machine that are trained. And we do the same. You know, maybe what we do is we ask a large language models to, model to create the training data that then we use to fine tune the model. And I think there are a couple of, of examples out there uh, as well. I think Stanford did that, uh, which is they used a, a large language model. I think it's a Facebook one, a meta one, to uh, generate labels. And then they fine tune the model on these labels. Uh, yes, it's happening. The problem is that if we use these models to generate new data, it's still a possibility that you know the bias is there. So the, we are not going to be redundant. We still need. We are still needed. We are needed to fix those elements. We are needed to mitigate the bias. We are needed to make sure that the process does improve. But we are getting there already. Yeah. Final final question. Yes. Um, so considering. Um, the hallucination bit that was mentioned earlier, uh, the problem of, of the systems coming up with information that's probably not correct. And in light of what you just said about um, supervised and unsupervised learning, from a technical perspective, why do these systems tell us these things that are wrong? How does it come up with it, considering that it's only good as considering that it's only as good as the data that goes into the system. Yeah, okay, let's, let's make an example. I don't know, I do not have an example for real, but let's think about an example. So I ask maybe the example of the, the, uh, the reference that was mistaken. Uh, so maybe what the machine has done uh, is you know, okay, say I, I need the reference here, fine. Then I need what a name, this name looks like a good name. Let's have a name here, and I name a third name, have a date. And you know, it's just a step by step uh, probabilistic approach that brought the machine creating a new reference that does not exist. Maybe the name of the author is right uh, because it does exist somewhere, um, but has never written that specific piece of knowledge. And this is because the machine does not really understand that. It's just picked the right. If you say maybe Claudio Galvino, maybe the first thing that comes up is FTI. And then if he needs to write about me, he will say, Claudio Galvino, FTI. Even though this is not really what he should be doing, if it is a little bit out of his comfort zone. Uh, does not have a, a, an understanding of what he's writing yet. Does not really know what he's writing. Cannot really judge if 
what is writing is right or wrong is, is, is factual if there are enough information out there that make this answer likely to happen. Perfect. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. I spent. And well done, everyone, for asking questions. <laughs>